Hello everybody! Welcome to the Periodic Table of History. Today we're going to be taking a look at Ireland. So here we have our graph view of the Earth, and over here we have our time graph. So here's Adam. Uh, Ireland's going to be right over here. We do have some genealogies that go back to Japheth, and then of course like we've been studying we have India over here, China, uh, Rome is over here, etc. But we're going to be looking in here to Irish history. And three of the things that I thought were the most interesting were uh, these genealogies and a book called Labor Gabala Erin. And then that takes us down into the time of Jesus and then the time of St. Patrick. So I mentioned Labor Gabala Erin because that's where we get this legendary Irish history. It had been compiled by poems, songs, dictates, and supposed previous manuscripts. And the scribes that put Labor Gabala Erin together were also trying to fuse, say, Druidic thought and Christian thought together and give a coherent history back to the time of the Bible. And it left off at Japheth over here. It did follow a template of the Bible, because remember, the Bible starts off with Adam goes down to the flood, and then we have Shem, Ham, Japheth, and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That same template is transposed into Labor Gabala Erin, in that it has genealogies that go back to Japheth. Though the Bible just tells us a few of the sons of Japheth, Labor Gabala Erin follows up on that template and extends the genealogies down here and gives us a little bit of detail on these Irish kings. So a lot of the scribes along the way, they tried to piece this history together and try to correct it. And every time they tried to correct it, it added more frustration and more confusion to the following scribes. And so if you get into the book Labor Gabala Erin, I just warn you that that is the task that you're faced with. It is quite frustrating. But just as an overview, there are six different takings of Ireland, because that's what Labor Gabala Erin means. It means the taking of Ireland. And then when it means taking, it's kind of like a conquest. And I don't care to get into the six different conquests that much. I will name them here. Uh, one was Cesare, then two is Partholon, three is Nemed, four is the Fir Bulg, and those are the people that carry the bags of dirt. That's what uh, some kind of translation from Fir Bulg, carriers of the bags. Uh, then five, Tuatha de Dinan, and six, the Milesians who are the Gaelic people from whence we get the Gaelic language, and Gaelic is a subdivision of the Celtic language. So we at least have a language correspondence between Gaelic and Celtic, which I was curious about because of the Gauls. All of these people groups have the uh, genealogies. We can look in here at some of these genealogies. They uh, see here is slang. That is the very popular, maybe first uh, fur bulg king, slang, slain, and there's a lot of different spellings of this, but supposedly slang or slain was a descendant of, of Japheth. Now various priests, various scribes have tried to estimate the time period where slain was a king in Ireland, and supposedly such and such, like 1934 to 1933 BC. So I would say these numbers are uh, not really well known. Now the Firbolg were uh, people that are actually tangible, and so, and so they are here in the periodic table of history. The six different takings of Ireland uh, seems like most of their entry points were over here on the southwest side of, of Ireland. That would be down here in Kinmare and Bantry Bay. So there's a lot of legends surrounding this area of people groups coming in from this direction. And there are actually quite a few uh, stone circles and things here too. And uh, Ireland is very well known for their 
stone circles like Drombeg and Urig stone circle or Ballymo stone circle. There's pictures of them there. So I'm going to zoom out. Uh, we get the legends of how these different conquests originated from. One of them was from Egypt. The conquerors went around the Mediterranean and they would have perhaps seen a bunch of these stone megaliths, megalith meaning big stone structure, a lot of megalithic structures that uh, have legend attached to them. Legends like in Greece, there's Tyrans in Peloponnese, Greece, and that's supposedly the birthplace of Hercules. So we see these uh, stone structures in Deorsen, the Tarxian temples in Malta, the Circio Mountain in Italy. And these may have been sites, the um, supposed Irish making their way around the Mediterranean, and they have some history in Portugal. They would have gone through these horns of Hercules and then up into Spain and then on to Ireland. But we see these stone structures all over the place. Uh, I think one of the most popular ones is Stonehenge. Just as far as Portugal and Ireland, there have been DNA studies done on that that show there are similarities. And as far as the Firbolg, and uh, going back over here to the kings that are actually here in the periodic table of history, as possible tangible kings, as you see here, slain and Rudrig and Gan and Syngan, um, those are supposed to have been slaves over here in Greece and got tired of being the people that carried the bags, and so they left and went over here to Ireland. So as far as the biblical template, the priests trying to uh, recreate an Irish history with a biblical template. They they have Shem, Ham, and Japheth, or as they have written here, Sim, Ham, and Aifeth, written here into their Labor Gabala Erin. And it has the wives' names, something that's interesting. I come across that a lot in this lore, and the names are all different in different languages all over the world, but sometimes they list their names. See, so they have uh, Koba, Ola, Oliva, Olivana as the wives of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. I just wanted to show you some clippings of the text that I thought were interesting. Right here it has where Shem, Ham, and Japheth died, supposedly. And so you can play with that to your heart's desire. I have the uh, genealogies to the Firbolg um, set in here up to Japheth. There were genealogies in Labor Gabala Erin that talked about all six takings of Ireland, and most of them went down to Magog. Here is one list that goes to Magog, the son of Japheth, Magog's son of Aifeth, of his progeny, are the peoples who came to Ireland before the Gaedil, to wit Parthalon. See, here is another snippet that talks about the Scots coming from Scythia. And again, you see Egypt in there, so they are trying to connect themselves with Egypt. But you see this is set up as a poem, and that's the way a lot of this lore is set up. Because there were so many songs that were copied down, it makes it very difficult to study this material. But there's a piece of it. We get the uh, inference to the Tower of Babel, similar to the Bible. I think we get a little bit curious about things we can't really know. But we try to know them. But if you do take a look at it, it is still interesting to see what people from the 7th to 11th century thought of their origins. And then it's just intriguing to think about all the possibilities of these ancient structures. So as far as the genealogies and the kings begotten kings begotten kings, uh, you can look in here that here's somewhere where slain may be. I didn't find a lot of interesting uh, things popping out, except there was some, there was a little bit about silver over here in the 1600s and 1400s BC. And we can move it down just a little bit to 1410 BC. Making a bunch of silver shields, giving them to the leaders of Ireland. Now we fast forward further to the time of Jesus, which is of great interest to myself. 
there are three kings here that would have lived during the time of Jesus, and they're Crimthan Nianer. Secondly, we have from 9 AD to 14 AD, Kerbre Thinshite. And then 14 AD to 36 AD, we have Feradak Finfaknak. The first and third king are in Laborgabala Iran, and the second king is in the Annals of the Four Masters. But here is the first one. We have a, uh, a battle, three brothers and a sister. The three brothers know they're going to die, so what they do is they commit incest with the sister. They go out to battle. They die. The sister is impregnated and has a son. That son is here, Krimthan Nia Nair. We get this small detail about him going out, finding a golden chariot and the splendid chessboard. And as histories go, we don't know much else about this character. But you can see the small addition there. It is the belief of certain historians that this was the time when the Son of the Living God, Jesus Christ, was born, somewhere around 8 BC to 9 AD. So you can see the scribes inserting sentences into the text. And there the same text is in Gaelic. The second king that would have been alive during the time of Jesus is Kerbre Sinshate, and supposedly the crops failed, the cows did not give milk, and there were no fish in the rivers, according to the Annals of the Four Masters. So he must have been a flop of a king, and so much so even the Borgabala Erin leaves him out. And then in English and Gaelic, we have this last snippet that talks about Feradak Finn Fechnach. Not much is going on here. We just have his name, a couple sentences, and you can read that. Pause it if you want to read it at any time. Remember, this is a very pieced together book, so it really doesn't flow very well. So I'm just giving you some of the snippets. The, the only thing else that I found was really interesting is we saw some some pirates attacking Ireland at the time of the Apostles, which would be around 76 to 106 AD. That's still the time when John the Beloved was alive when pirates were attacking during the time of Tuathal Texmar. There is Tuathal Tectmar. Tuathal took a strong, powerful hold over Ireland after destroying her pirates and her bandits. So remember from the England videos that uh, Viking conquests uh, did very extensive raids and subjugations of England and Ireland. Uh, that was about 800 to 1200 AD. So now we're 700 years earlier than that, in 100 AD, and I think this was the first time I saw a reference to pirates. Now we get into the life of St. Patrick. So I'm going to move my arrow down here just a bit. The previous king, Nathi, was struck by lightning in 428 AD. So Benjamin Franklin could probably teach something to Nathi about not running around with your sword in a lightning storm, but as the story goes, he was battling against a fortress there, and lightning just came out of the blue and gone. And the king that went face to face with St. Patrick and vice versa lived from 428 to 458 or thereabouts. Remember the dates are not really certain still. Here is the big picture of the time scale and where we are with reference to St. Patrick. St. Patrick was born in 385 in Banwin, England. And you can see Banwin over here on the map. Now, Patrick was the son of a Roman, but the Roman lived out here on the very edge of the Roman Empire. Because remember, they didn't do very well with mountains. And over here in Wales, it's much more mountainous, and then up in Scotland. So you have Hadrian Wall across here in Scotland, with a mountainous region to the north. And then we have uh, this mountainous region in Wales as well, with England being right here on the outpost. Men snatchers, as the Bible calls them, came and took Patrick from his Roman home in Banwin, England. He was a slave in Ireland for six years, and he tended sheep. Now, we have a document that's written by St. Patrick himself, 
and in it we are told that Patrick escaped Ireland and went back to England. And that was a miraculous escape because anybody who is a slave would be put to death. But when he went to a ship, the ship did allow him to go with them to England. And when he got to England, he ran back to his home. Now, Patrick felt called to be an apostle to Ireland and did work with the Church of England. And though they were pretty skeptical of him because he had lost many years as a slave, they still allowed him to learn. And eventually he was sent back to Ireland, and that was in 432. AD. In 433, we get a story of an event happening on the hill of Terra and the hill of Slain. And we can zoom in here very close to Dublin is the hill of Terra. The solstices and the equinoxes were very important to Druidism. So the king ordered on one of these events that nobody have any fire. And St. Patrick decided he would have fire. So there's another hill to the north called the Hill of Slain, and that's where Patrick started his fire, unlawful in the kingdom to do such a thing. Now Patrick had a biographer about 150, 200 years after him, and that's where we get a lot of the miracles that are associated with Patrick. Patrick did win over the king, and he won over Ireland. Patrick was building up the church in Ireland. He had great success. Uh, he is known to have prayed and fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and that was over here in Croag, Patrick. People go there to hike this mountain quite a bit, even today. And during his ministry, as the numbers began to increase, a lot of the women were taking vows of poverty and vows of serving the church, working with the church. One of these churches got hit by some English pirates. English pirates killed a bunch of his clergymen, and he had a qualm then with the English church. He asked the English church to denounce those pirates, and the English church would not. So Patrick denounced the English church, and that put him at odds with the orthodoxy. And that is why we get this confession of St. Patrick. I give you a snippet of it here. It's not really that long, uh, but it's well worth reading, and you can look it up online at your convenience. In England, they're trying to accuse Patrick of malplay, and then he gives his defense, his confession, of his own life in order to give himself legitimacy against the Church of England. Well, it was a great political debacle for the Church of England, so Patrick didn't get burned at the stake, and he lives another day to do more ministry. A lot of what is known about Patrick is listed in the Book of Armagh. There is a man named Tirishin in 668 that documents some of the works of Patrick, and those are inscribed into the book of Armagh. And the thing about this book is it may be one of the oldest writings in Irish history. So we're talking about transcription from 668 into 807 AD. And that is very highly venerated here in Dublin. And you can still see some of the ancient works at Trinity College. So in 461, Patrick died, and there were many a fan of Patrick. That's why his legacy lives on. Uh, Europe was plunged into a, a dark age, but remember Ireland is over here on the westerly side of that, so they are a little bit insulated. Lots of the works that we have had been migrated over into Ireland, transcribed and saved, and the Irish were the ones that brought literature into a new age. As while Europe itself was experiencing this dark age from the imperial church from about 500 to 1500 AD with the imperial Catholic church, Ireland was able to do some innovations. And they were the one that invented the space between words. They invented paragraphs. 
They developed the difference between upper and lower case words. They were the ones that put these really ornate, really big artistic first words on pages. They put pictures on the pages and the offshoot and legacy of St. Patrick lived on in the scribes who wrote the Book of Kells. And the Book of Kells is there in Dublin, Ireland in Trinity College. These were very ornate copies of the Gospels. So you can see these beautiful pictures here. So we're back in Ireland in the land where the apostles, the original apostles, probably thought they were in the utter ends of the earth. And remember the great commission of Jesus that said, go into all the world, baptizing and teaching. Now, England and Ireland, they got a little extra dose of Christianity from early on, because remember, Peter visited England and Scotland, and we also have Simon the Zealot coming up into the southern part of England. People are just stealing, killing, and destroying, and then the missionaries, empowered by the Holy Spirit, go in there, enact works of wonders based on the Holy Spirit, the people convert, education centers spring forth, problems are solved, and then we get the secondary group of people that take over and generally destroy everything that was built up. We see the building up of society, and we see the dismantling of society. And sadly, the people that love to dismantle society don't really know what they're asking. They don't really know that mass mayhem is the only thing that can ensue without this idea of repentance and forgiveness. We have brave people like Patrick building up society. We have families trying to build up society. So let's take a moment and reflect about our own life and how we can build and help the people around us, just like St. Patrick did, and not do the things the wicked ones do, tearing down our structures. Thanks for watching and thanks for exploring Ireland with me. If you want to explore this more, I'd recommend getting into the books of Genesis, Exodus, Joshua, Judges, and then read Labor Gabala Erin, then the Confessions of St. Patrick, the Book of Armagh, and the Book of Kells. And if you want to get into a parallel thought process with that, you can go into the English Venerable Bede, and that'll give you a lot to think about with regard to how Ireland became what it is today. Well, I hope we all can make the world a better place. Have a great day, a great week, a great month. And I'll see you in the next video.